Hello everybody, welcome to some story time. My name is Wiss and I'm going to be uh, giving you a little bit of a treat and read for you the entirety of the Pokemani lore. Uh, if you're not up to date with the Pokemani storyline stuff, um, I highly recommend that you go to the top of the playlist and check out all of those various different bits and bobs across the various different games and FPSs that make up the Pokemon storyline, um, because there will be spoilers in this. Um, it's at the end of the playlist for a reason. Um, but with no further ado, I will get into it. So, 54 years ago, the Pokemani tribe lived on Cinnabar Island in the Independent Isles. They were a worn people who lived comfortably with a culture rich in arts, learning and ceremony. It was governed by a council, each member a representative of each of the ten different types of Pokemani. Not all Pokemani were peaceful, however. Under the surface, the ghost-type representative, Helios Dahara, was of the mind that they should expand their territory. There were bountiful islands around theirs, which would make great homes for their people. Why, there were enough islands that each type could have their own. It did not matter to Helios that many of those islands were already home to other communities of Toons. It did however, matter to the rest of the council. He was unable to garner any support for this notion, even citing capacity issues on their island, which were not based on truth at all, and so his proposal was dismissed. Determined to sway the opinion of the council, he started using magic and alchemy to influence the minds of other ghost types, and from there, dark types. Little things here and there, not so much as overt as straight-up mind control, but influence enough that they joined his platform willingly without realising the full implications of it. Helios tried to get the dark type representative on side through charisma and political pressure from the people of his type, rather than trickery. But even with the rising support of two of their types, the dark type representative refused to condone anything that resembled invasion of other islands, and the council as a whole would not be swayed either. An argument broke out in the council chambers, Helios reacting violently. Due to his radical views and a lack of self-control and reason, Helios was removed from the council. But you cannot fire a man like Helios Dahara and expect that his power and influence end with his employment. Now fueled with vengeance and a lingering rage, Helios decided that the council was no longer fit to rule, and so, using the influence he had already seeded within the ghost and dark types of Cinnabar, he lay seeds of discontent. Thinking that their freedom was at stake, at his call they took up arms, and the civil war began. Helios was a smart man. Even if he had every member of the ghost and dark types on side, which he didn't, Two types against eight was not good odds for success just by sheer numbers. So he worked in the background at first. Small attacks on civic buildings, small riots, discontent. Things that the council would leave to local law enforcement at first and largely ignore. But after time and constant unrest, they started to see the pattern. The types that were always involved. And even having done very little. Helios raised suspicion and mistrust among the other types, which in turn flowed on to feeling repressed or discriminated against in the types he favoured. Riots broke out of their own accord, attacks happened more openly, and finally, eventually, Helios became brazen enough to launch his own attacks, the greatest of which was the last. He led the charge against the council chambers with the intent to seize control. The council did not fare well. They tried to disable more than kill the attackers, hoping reinforcements would come to their aid. But their attackers fought with no restraint, and Helios himself struck down the council members one by one, until there were only two remaining. Diane Alamos and Ark Alamos, the light and power representatives, were the last to fall. 
They had married several months before Helios had started his attack and were fiercely protective of one another. Diane was not down, wounded, but still living, leaving Ark to face off against Helios alone. For a time, the two seemed evenly matched, but after a fierce battle, Ark faltered, and Helios brought down on him for a killing blow. Using the last of her strength, Diane sprung forward between the two and was caught in Helios's attack instead. She died in Ark's arms. Some part of Ark died with her, but it was not his reason. He knew that if he continued to battle against Helios, then he would surely perish. So instead, he took Diane's body and fled the council chambers, allowing Helios to take control of the building. Ark fled through the chaotic streets of their home to the Hall of Origin. But instead of going up to the library or the research rooms or the observatory, he went down. Down to the catacombs where the dead were put to rest. Under the gaze of the Keeper of the Dead, he lay his beloved to rest in the catacombs, and then began to work on his counterattack. In straight combat, he would be defeated, but Ark decided to use his cunning. He worked for three days on a trap, combining artificer technique with the magics the Keeper used. He created a spell to seal Helios away, and the destination that he chose was the very Hall of Origin itself, the core of Cinnabar the very thing which the ghost type craved so badly. With his traps set, he then made a call of challenge to Helios. And Helios, arrogant from his victory, answered the call. Ark, more rested but still weakened from their previous fighting, lured Helios in a battle through the Hall of Origin to the room where he had set up his trap. And then, when the ghost leader was in position, he sprung the trap and sealed Helios' body and spirit into the very stone of the hall. Using a technique known as Life Lock, Ark ensured that no interference could release the tyrant from his prison, his very life preventing anything from breaking the spell. But Helios' binding within the very stones of the Hall of Origin, which was carved from the mountains of Cinnabar Island itself, was not as instantaneous as Ark had hoped. The natural urge to escape confinement and the anger at being tricked shook the island to its core and it started to break apart and sink beneath the ocean. Ark led an evacuation, urging people towards boats, though the prejudices that Helios had sown throughout the civilian Pokemani had ghost and dark types forcibly shoved off the ships by panicked people, placing their own safety above who they saw as the ones responsible for the destruction of their home. Few ships made it off the island, and fewer still to safety. The ocean was a deadly mess of unnatural tides and waves as the water rushed to fill the space once occupied by Cinnabar Island. Many boats sank, forming a reef of destroyed ships all around Cinnabar's former location. Ark led them south, and they made shore on a small island some distance from their old home. Less than 100 Pokemoni survived. With the people seeking comfort in a familiar authority, Ark assumed leadership of this new settlement. The island was uninhabited and beautiful, with a nice flat lower area for the town and a higher, slightly hilly area, which would be ideal for a new hall of origin. He coordinated all hands, including the few ghost and dark types that did survive, in building their new home. But peace had not yet fallen. The survivors of the war and the destruction of Cinnabar Island were still suffering from the political tampering Helios had spread. The small handful of ghost and dark types that remained were treated as riffraff and criminals, no matter their behaviour, judged more harshly for mistakes and allowed poorer living conditions than the others. These few huddled around each other for safety and companionship, and the rift grew. As the settlement stabilised and life began to calm, the ghost and dark types slowly started trying to barter for better treatment. They had not been participants in the war and just wanted to live their lives, same as anyone else. Yon O'R, the oldest of the group, led peaceful protests, spoke to the people in charge of each area, explained their situation. 
some of their number were children and living in poverty. This was not right, not when they had so much of nature's bounty to share there. The populace would not be swayed. So Yon sought an audience with Ark Alamos, in the hopes that their new governor would be able to solve their problem. But the compassion in Ark's heart had died with his wife, and he scolded Yon for his brazen behaviour. The two argued, and even though Yon never became violent, Ark had him arrested and imprisoned. The others under Yon's care were also put into prison with him, Though once they had all been rounded up, Ark came to realise that putting him in jail was a temporary solution. He needed a better place for these two types, where they would not cross paths with what he saw as decent folk. So he started building. He found another island, to the northwest of where Cinnabar used to be, and erected a barrier over the whole island, using another life lock to maintain it. This barrier would allow anyone to pass inside, but ghost and dark types could not cross back. He then had Yon and all the others placed on a boat and shipped over. But this was not enough. The completion of the new Mutherhood building had him realise that ghost and dark types could be born to anyone using their services, regardless of the parent's own typing. So he approached the only two Pokemani that he fully trusted, Nia Janice, a priestess of the Mutherhood, and the Keeper of the Dead. He ordered Mia to take any ghost or dark type eggs that manifested in the Mutherhood, and without notifying the parents that it existed, to the Keeper of the Dead, who would take them across to this new island, which he called Kantos, to live there away from the others. It was a secret that he would defend with increasing levels of viciousness over the years. These two, a power type dedicated to life and a water type dedicated to death, agreed between themselves to obey this command, though not for Ark's sake. If they refused, he might order a worse fate. At least this way, they had a good chance at life. So the two began removing ghost and dark type eggs before they hatched, and also delivering supplies to the new island without Ark's knowledge. Over time, Kantos became a thriving community, with a natural beauty to match Jotos, with a bustling town in its centre that they called Lavender Town. Yon took up the position of the leader of this new community, founding a new hall of origin for themselves, putting education at the fore. Though, in his own way, he kept some information from the people. He would not forget what was done to them but he never spoke the names of the two councilmen responsible for their imprisonment around the others, simply giving them their titles of the Governor and the King of Rings and nothing more. He didn't want the tragedy of Cinnabar Island to fall to mystery, but he did not want hatred to bloom in the hearts of the people either. Unaware of his counterpart island's development, Ark did not stop with the removal of the people themselves. He made his way to the new Hall of Origin they had freshly built, and in a desperate and blasphemous move, took every book, what of them had been salvaged from Cinnabar Island since the disaster, and any he could find that mentioned dark and ghost types, as well as their magics, primarily druidic nature magics, and destroyed them. He did not have enough cruelty in his heart to slaughter them, but he wanted to make it so that they did not exist. But this was a move that did more than step on religious sensibilities. Unbekant, the patron of the Pokemani, god of knowledge, writing, and books, was furious at this deliberate destruction of his books, doubly so as it was to destroy knowledge. And in retaliation, he cursed the island of which Ark was so proud. The plants began to wither and die. Those who remained did their best to keep the plants, especially the food plants, alive, but it was for naught. Unbekant had made it so only druidic magics, that which Ark had just tried to destroy, would be able to remove his curse. And further still, skewed the inclinations of new Pokemani born, so that only ghost and dark types were falling into the magics that were needed. It wasn't enough to simply know the spells. The proud governor would need to allow the two spurn types back to the island to undo what he had done. 
This was a decision the deity would come to regret, however. Because Ark did not connect the withering of his island to his banishment of the ghost and dark types, and so he did not allow them back, and in fact dismissed the idea of the blight on their island being the doing of the god entirely, though it was certainly a concern of the Pokemoni people. He didn't really care why it was happening, only that it was. So he did what he always did when faced with problems. He started to build. He built a tall spire in the middle of town and spread lines from the spire all throughout the island like tree roots, so no corner would be left without the effects. He called it the Spire of Vitality. To bring this vitality, he created a power source to fuel his new creation, which he called the Jewel of Life. It was a cheap facsimile of druidic magic, the best his artificer magic could manage. But the result was satisfactory, if a bit temperamental. So long as the jewel sat within the spire, the island would thrive. If it was removed, everything would begin to weather again. To protect the island, he impressed upon the few people that knew of the jewel and the tower's purpose to keep it a secret. Over the course of the next 20 years, the secret became a rarely thought of memory. New Pokemani children were born, elders were passing on. Life was finally becoming peaceful, even with the things happening in the background. After a time, Ark had the realisation that he was maintaining two life locks, which, by their nature, would fail should he pass on. Due to the nature of Toons being what it was, this could happen in 50 years or a thousand. But it was still not something he wished to entertain. Much of the information about the lifelock technique was lost when Cinnabar sank, but he was able to puzzle together a solution to his problem. He could transfer the lock to another if they had the capacity to maintain it. He was not inclined to involve anyone new about what he had put into place, it would require too much explaining, too much pressure, and there were no Pokemon he knew of that had shown an aptitude for artificer technique as he had anyway. Ideally, he realised, he needed a younger version of himself. Cloning was not in his skill set. So instead, he went to the Mugahood and asked Mia to facilitate a child of his. The Mugahood was, and to this day still is, a facility that helps all Pokemani with all manners of medical assistance, but are often thought of primarily with their role in fertility. Same-sex couples and those desiring to be single parents would often come for assistance with having children. So, Ark's request was not outside of the ordinary for them, though Mia was still baffled by it. Still, this at least she could do without guilt. And before too long, she was able to present Ark with a white and pink egg. When the light-type child hatched, Ark felt a part of his heart that he had not felt in a long time, twang with pain. She looked so very much like Diane. He would marvel for years that she was not born to her. He named her Celeste. As Celeste grew, it became clear to Ark that she had no aptitude for artificing. She was an insatiable reader and had no end of kindness. It seemed more and more to Ark that he had achieved a younger version of his wife instead. Even her voice rang the same. When Celeste was seven years old, old enough to largely manage herself in his view, he sought to try again. Ark told her what he was attempting, to get her a sibling, in an effort to curb any prying into things that she shouldn't when another child should appear and the result was rampant enthusiasm. He had high hopes for this child, a feeling that this time he would get what he wanted. By this stage it had been almost 40 years since the Calamity and the curse of Jotos, and Unbekant had not yet lost hope in his people. So he interfered again, hoping that this time the damage being caused by Ark might be halted, and the ten types could be united again. When Ark received a message from Mia that there was an egg of his, he took Celeste with him to retrieve it. He ended up regretting this decision. Mia had the egg bundled in a blanket and looked uneasy. 
and Ark felt a void open in his stomach when he laid eye on the black, dark red and grey egg she presented him with. Had he not had his daughter excitedly chattering about her new sibling by his side, he would have ordered that dark-type child to be put on the ferry to the other island immediately. He was silent for a long time, trying to make his voice rise to the order. But he couldn't. So he took the child home. He named the child Raymond, a boy born with a vibrant blue eye just like his sister's, and the same grey coloration of his head that Ark also had, though that coloration extended to his body as well, unlike the white colour of Ark's. And for at least the first few years, Ark was mostly indifferent to him. Not that he was left idle, that is. Raymond was the son of an aristocrat and would be educated as such. The finest manners, the best education, the finest foods. Though Ark never let him outside their manor house. And when there were any visitors, the child was hidden away. It was said to the public that the child was sick, too sick to be in company, and the people accepted that. When Raymond was four, however, things changed. Ark needed to do ma regular maintenance on the spire in order to keep it working correctly, and on one occasion he needed to take the young child with him. In the middle of the night, so no one would see his supposedly sickly child, Ark took Raymond into the main chamber of the Spire of Vitality so he could get his work done. With a firm word for Raymond to stay out of the way, the child moved to sit off to one side. But a clumsy bump of the pedestal that held the jewel on the way past sent the artifact rolling to the floor. Raymond scurried to pick it up as his father let out a furious and privately rather panicked snarl. The moment the child's hands wrapped around the jewel, the room was filled with a bright green light. Grass started sprouting up through the gaps in the tiles at his feet, and the boy was mesmerised by it. But then the effect ended and the light faded, leaving a very sleepy toddler and a bewildered governor. Ark placed the jewel back on its pedestal and thought hard, while Raymond lay down on the floor to sleep. His child had magic. Not the sort of magic that Ark had been hoping for when he endeavoured to have children, but magic. Magic that created plants. That created life. It was not the solution he had been looking for, but it was a solution he could use. So after that day, Ark became, began a regime of dreadfully gruelling training with his son. That young mind needed to be sharp as could be, and his magic powerful. If he could get strong enough, then what they had seen in the spire could spread to the whole island. The grass that Raymond had created never wilted, even with the jewel removed from its cradle. He needed it to work. He needed Raymond's power. The child did not like the treatment much, however. The constant training and exhaustion, the punishments if he did not obey or succeed in his lessons... Raymond's only joy was the small amount of time he got to spend with Celeste, who he had been given the nickname Selly. The house staff were more or less indifferent, their father cruel and unrelenting. But she was kindness. As little of it as he got, he loved his time with her. After many years, the treatment only got worse. Raymond got stronger and, as all teenagers do, started to push boundaries. Trying to fight back threatening to run away, trying to get the slightest bit of grace from his unrelenting father. This had the opposite effect, and Ark used his superior knowledge of the boy's physiology, converted his room into a bright prison that was impossible for him to escape. The only time he was not locked in the white-walled room was when he was at his lessons with his father, or in the garden with Sally. You can only control someone th through fear for so long, and Raymond was no exception. In a way that echoed the tendencies of his father more than he would ever realise, he looked at his problem and decided to, that to solve it, he needed to build. When he was in the garden, he played hide-and-seek with Sally to get away from her view, and in those fleeting moments, over the course of months, built himself a small boat, hidden at the small sliver of coast that was walled into their home. Eventually it was finished, 
and with a careful drop of stealth, he managed to get away from the house staff one evening, to his boat, and away. It was a desperate and regrettably poorly researched escape, but ultimately successful one, which had him making landfall at the Easel Isle further to the north. His story continued from there. Back on Jotos, though, the anger that Sally and the staff were subjected to was incomparable. Most of the staff lost their jobs, and Sally started spending as little time at home as she possibly could, taking refuge in the Hall of Origin and its library. The people around Ark grew ever fewer, and his heart grew ever colder. Elsewhere, another story was unfolding. The soul is not meant to be used as a battery. This is why life locks were so uncommonly used. But Ark was powering two of them. And while he did not wish for Helios to be freed from the prison he had created, in Ark's determination to keep ghost and Tark types hidden, his focus on Helios, the very man who set him on this path, was almost a distant problem. And slowly, Helios was regaining consciousness. He pulled his body, now the whole of the cracked and ocean-stained Cinnabar Island, out of the water, bit by bit. This was a perplexing issue for the warlord. He could think and hear and somewhat see, and magic flowed through him as much as it had ever done. But with a outer more common kind of body, his reach was limited. He was, in essence, a genius loci, a living location. This limitation would not do for a man who wanted his revenge. So he set about getting himself some loyal assistance. With as much magic as he could muster, he desecrated the grave of a dark-type Pokemani that had been set to rest in the Hall of the Dead. Gar Hounds. And brought him back to life. Gar became his lieutenant, and the two of them set about a decades-long quest to return Helios to the world properly. Magic was not Gar's strong suit, so working through him proved difficult. He also needed to leave Cinnabar on occasion for supplies, as the ruined island no longer held any bounties to sustain the living. It was on one of these occasions that some explorers arrived. They poked around through the small amount of Cinnabar that had risen above the water, and took some of Helios' magical items, which had been created in an attempt to free him. Without being able to do much about it, and with his one ally not present, Helios could not prevent the theft. Fuming, Helios' next command to Gar was to increase their ranks. Gar started raiding the boat of the Keeper of the Dead, who now went by the title of the Ferryman, stealing eggs and newborns from his deck to be raised as Helios' minions. Some of these children required resuscitation by Helios on arrival, casualties of the harsh weather of the sea or not treated well enough by Gar during their retrieval. But over time, Gar came to be raising four children, Betty, Georgia, Yoko and Nick, to serve their master trapped within the very walls. These children had various skills that Helios found very useful. Yoko, in particular, had an aptitude for magic, and he was able to work through her to create rings for them each, to help keep them safe, though it was out of selfishness more than care. He did not particularly wish to raise more children. He sent his allies out across Ankwell over the course of the next two decades, keeping tabs on Jotos and Ark, as well as searching for anything that could help them free Helios from his binds. Through skying magic, they knew the ins and outs of of Jotos better than any resident, including of the Spire and its purpose. They knew they lacked the power to fell Ark and release Helios that way, so they orchestrated inconveniences and frustrations for him as an interim measure. One such occasion saw Nick approaching Ralph Zerks and his two Dark-type crew with a job to steal the jewel from the Spire. Ralph had no qualms with taking this job. He was a survivor of Cinnabar, and one of the few who knew about the removal of children from the Mutherhood. As such, he detested Ark with a passion. They were ultimately arrested, 
having been disrupted by the group of adventurers that they had selected to be their scapegoats for the theft. This resulted in Ralph being incarcerated in a prison in Ghibli, and Nick and Ralph's crew, Yareth and Nereth, being taken across the ocean to Kantos. Even with this reduction in their ranks, they continued on. Nick made efforts to try and raise rebellion in his new location, but Yon put a stop to that before it could take root in his community. Helios was not content to leave Ark alone, even after this failure. With more scrying, he was able to locate the missing child Raymond, now going by the name Rye, under the care of Detective Little Lynn Stagehand. Knowing what he did about Ark's child, and having watched Rye and his new caretaker and friends, Helios had one of his minions deliver a tip to the governor about the location of his missing child. As expected, Ark swept to Toontown to retrieve him, taking him right back to that horrid white room where he had once been, to fulfil the role that Ark had assigned him. Helios had assumed that a mother's rage would have Lynn ripping down walls and laying waste to Ark's home and work to get her child back. He was not counting on this rage being tempered with reason and the reason of her allies. So this ultimately came to no benefit of his, instead relieving some concern of Ark's, with Rai lifting the curse on Jotos before being taken swiftly home. Eventually, Helios' allies came across the works of the architect wizard Faber Dominin. With his work with genius Loki, and trying to create a body for them to roam the world in, Helios devised a plan. The King of Rings was a skilled spellsmith, and while he had no interest in aiding Faber's goals, these sophisticated items might just be what he needed to free himself from his bonds in a way that would not alert Ark of their doings. He created a spell that worked similarly to an existing spell known as Magic Jar. He then sent his minions to test it, who snared an unsuspecting Chifley and Missy Ford as their test subjects. Through the interference of a group of adventurers that had been mixed up in the plot, which had also doubled as an attempt at retrieving the artefact that had been taken from Cinnabar years prior, the experiment was not fulfilled to completion. But it was enough. With some more refinements, Yoko was sent to deliver the spell to Faber, who did not think about it as hard as he should have before integrating this new spell into his Locus Ambulata project. While what Faber did with the magic was ultimately put to an end, for Helios' purposes, it was a success. He then started to make plans for his own Ambulata, to move his soul from his entrapment into a new body, all the while keeping tabs on the genius loci that Faber had involved, or at least the ones he could access. There was an unexpected interruption in Helios's thoughts during this time. A small party of Pokemani poking around the ruins of their former home. They were not ghost or dark types, though Helios could see potential uses for them. He ordered Gar to try and recruit them. While appealing to their dislike of Ark Alamost almost had them on side, the notion of the entire Isles being invaded by this new power was a deal-breaker, and the three fled the island after defeating Helios' allies in combat. Helios was growing bored with seeing his allies fail. His determination for a body of his own only grew. Their first test of using the modified Ambulata magic was a roaring success. Helios was a man of many plans, however, and used this body to take Faber out of the picture, in a way that he hoped would get a reaction from Faber's friends, in the way his attempt with Lynn's family did not. Not wanting him to have the capacity to assist in interfering with his plans, Helios lay siege to the hometown of the architect, putting him and his sister under a modified feeble mind spell, warping their minds to cause them to act as cats. He put this spell behind a lifelock of his own, so attempts to remove the spell would fail. He also lay the seeds of Lavender Town being the source of the attack, hoping that Faber's companions would attack it and perhaps bring down the barrier that kept them on the island. Partially to free his ally inside, but also to further inconvenience his most hated enemy. Testing his body in combat with Faber's friends proved very informative, and he left that combat to create a better one. Over the course of the next nine months... 
He and his allies worked hard on his new body. They also performed an additional test, to test how it reacted across barriers, like Ark's Cantos barrier. It seemed to work on Nick with no issues, his original body dying, as his soul left it to take up residence in the new one. They were finding, however, that the bodies they were crafting were not of a quality that was acceptable to Helios. So they staged a raid on the Dominium home, a genius loci by the name of Ashling, taking Faber's notes and quality materials for their own purposes. They then returned to Cinnabar to craft a proper body for their master. These doings did not go unnoticed by Ark as much as they had hoped, however. Every time Helios left his binding, Ark could feel it through the life lock. It was a movement of the soul he had bound to his own, and after feeling it enough times, he decided to investigate. And by now, his patience with dark and ghost types had been exhausted. He made his way to Cinnabar with intent to end things once and for all. This had Ark arriving at the same time as the party that were reacting to the raid on Ashling, which included Ark's own daughter. He still had fondness for her that stretched over from the part of his heart still dedicated to his wife, who he re- she resembled so much. So he gave them an out, dropping them into the catacombs below, before turning to fight Helios in his new, higher-quality ambulata. While they fought above, this group uncovered the item that Ark had created so long ago to trap Helios in the first place. With some unexpected and extraordinary personal existence from Umbacant himself, they took this magic and used it to entrap not only Helios, but all five of his allies. And instead of using lifelock magic, they gave them to Umbacant to serve a sentence in his realm of the astral plane, a library he called Alf. As for Ark, he was arrested by Detective Little N's stagehand for the assorted crimes he had been committing, put in anti-magic cuffs, which was not only preventing escape, but shattered the lifelock holding the ghost and dark types bound on Kantos. Two antagonists were put into prisons appropriate to their stations, and the Pokemani were free. Where it goes from here... No one knows.